Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's performance will include Afghan rocks, psychic hippos, and Scandinavian murder machines as we dive into the color blue on Created Things. Howdy and welcome to Created Things, a podcast of Catholic creatives and the only podcast where the hosts are pretty much permanently blue, but damn, does it look good on us. I am your host, artist and psychotherapist, Jacob Flores Popcheck. With me, as always, is my good and excellent friend, Catholic priest, medievalist, edgelord, Father Gabriel Toretta. <laughs> Hello, doing, I am. I am all these things. Thank you. I have people. People always say, you know, Father Gabriel, you are so edgy. The way that you do things in a very not edgy way. It's so edgy. It's like the center of edgy or the edge of center. Yeah, I mean, there is sort of this irony of like you are so not alternative that it is actually ridiculously alternative. Yeah, people have been doing what I do for like eight hundred years. Um, and that means that it's weird. This is like, I get this conversation a lot. So like, I, uh, you know, so I'm a Dominican priest. We wear, we wear, um, you know, the same things that like we have worn since about 1216, which right, is cool. Like, not unlike Mickey Mouse, you open the closet, you see like 800 you see, exactly the same outfit. And you just, you just pull, you pull the one for the day. You know, that's, that's how mm -hmm. you do it. Um, but like it will happen with some frequency that people will come up and express um, sometimes shock, sometimes horror, sometimes irritation or frustration that I'm wearing like, quote, such weird clothes. But they're often themselves wearing like this has happened to me like, multiple times, like um, like a guy coming up to me wearing like a torn fishnet shirt or like, a, you know, I like <laughs> a dude uh, with like gigantic. Um, uh, what do you call the the rings in the ears? The. Um, the gauges gauges yeah and like all covered in like tats and face tats and stuff and like looks turns to his girlfriend when he sees me and says like what the mm, you know and all this and i like to think i just keep thinking of myself like guys we've been doing this for 800 years it's you guys who are doing something weird yeah but but at the same time there is something to be said for the sort of the kurt cobain syndrome of when weirdness becomes mainstream enough that which is traditional then becomes weird again and it's all relative and it's all wibbly wobbly timey wimey yeah speaking of which i'm going to invest in a flannel habit just so that i can really get that kind of northwest vibe going oh god so camp i love it oh yeah. my god yeah that's like met gala shit i would i would eat that up yeah have you watched any of the stuff from the met gala this year i uh, no. i try not to Oh, uh, why? You're missing out. It was delightful. The theme was uh, was the Gilded Age, and only two people even bothered to look at the prompt. <laughs> That's incredible. I do, I do like that, where it's sort of like, oh, okay, yeah. So there's a prompt, and I'm just gonna wear some stuff that's really expensive. Okay, good, done, 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 done. I don't understand that. Like, <laughs> the, isn't the fun of going to a costume party wearing a costume? Like, why are these people too cool to play? Like, there was a number of people who did. Um, number of designers who did neon outfits neon pink neon green mm -hmm. because they i guess all read the same fun fact which is that like fluorescent or neon was discovered in the 1890s but it wasn't as a textile it was discovered as a gas yeah and right so they, like, yeah didn't like literally any neon further gas. than that yeah yeah and yeah. they were just like what if everyone wore a highlighter that's the gilded age right yeah that's yeah <laughs> yeah i mean technically speaking that's the highlighted age which is between like seventh and ninth grade but yes that's absolutely right. true yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's or is that the highlighter age i forget anyway right, it the highlighter matter. age it's yeah, all yeah, the yeah. same it's all the same yeah you're when, when you're sniffing them you know yeah. that's more college that could also be the highlighter age yeah that's, that's what i was doing anyway Anywho, uh, we're talking about highlighters and neon colors, and um, this this is kind of the first in a series that I've been wanting to do for about a billion years, which is yeah, I just before time began. Be, actually, that was the most amazing yeah, thing. Exactly. Yeah, more than fourteen point six billion years ago. I think our best episodes are the ones that are like the most ridiculously niche. Like our worst episodes are definitely the ones where it's like, let's answer some 
theological question or let's let's ponder some explicit answer to an artistic thing and let's talk about something that anybody like, cares about why would we do right. that our best episodes are like let's dissect a bathroom sign Yay! Like, and, and, and this is kind of that uh it's also one of my other favorite things where it's just gonna be like a free-for-all of of you and i just trading information and nerdy things because you know we're an arts podcast and I thought it'd be just really cool to do a series, not in in you know consecutive order. We'll we'll dip into it here and there, the same way we're with symbolism and things like this. But I thought it'd just be really really cool to do a series on colors, and just do an episode on a color. And if you know anything about the history of color theory or um, the psychology of color theory or anything, if you're gonna do a series like that, you've got to start with the color blue. You have to. It's kind of the most important color. And I don't think a lot of people know that. Um, and there's just so much to do here with blue. There's just so much to do. With yeah. Blue. And and we are going to do our very best to make sure that everything that we say is in rhyming triplets. So, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Sometimes right. it's going to involve, you know, bad, bad Dr. Seuss rhymes. Like, there's so much to do with blue. There's just so much to do. But you know what? Like, it's okay. Like, we just want everyone to accept that. Yeah. But, you know, accept us. Uh, be tolerant. Um, there's a lot of cool history with blue that I'm excited to get into. I'm also excited to touch on just some of our individual favorite artistic examples of blue being used. And, uh, I've got some examples from like film and theater and dance and visual arts and all kinds of shit. So, um, God, where do we, where do you want to start with this topic? How do we even begin to unpack well, I think we have to say without any further ado, let's, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think we don't say that at some point. I, I mean, we're going to get arrested, so I don't want that to happen. Um, right. Uh, let's let's do a little bit of the deep history here, um, because okay, yeah. one of the strange things, you're, I mean, you're right. It's It seems contradictory or strange or just very unexpected to say like, well, if you're going to talk about colors um, individually, like you have to start talking with blue. Um that's kind of a counterintuitive proposition, but it is really true. Um, and one of blue the reasons true. it's true um, to talk to start with talking about blue is because it's the thing to do. You see there, I did it. Um, uh, uh, is because it wasn't important for so long. And mm -hmm. that's what's so weird about it is that it yeah. wasn't important for so long that like, all of the kind of Paleolithic and Neolithic anywhere in the world um, images that we have use um, basically black, red, and white. Right. Um, that like those are the those apparently are like the earliest original color palette is just like black, red, and white. Um, right. And red is generous, right? I mean, you're really talking about like sort of a brown sienna. It's a broad. It's clay. a broad. Yeah, yeah, it's a broad scope of different things that we, we can, that you could call reds. You know. Um, and. Uh, and that you don't really get any interest in blue. Now, just focus, like, um, I think when I'm talking about this, I'm really going to be focused on the Western world just um, because you, you just, you're in a whole different world of, like, minerals and um, stones and plants and stuff when you, once, once mm -hmm. you start talking about China and Japan, for instance. Um, but, uh, but, you know, for, like, the West, there's this whole weird thing that, like, blue just seems to be completely absent from people's descriptions, right? So, like... Um, I know this is something that's close to your heart. Like, um, think about with the Greeks, right? So like, mm -hmm. uh, already something weird. Um, Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, I was wondering which one of us would, would, yeah. would uh, bring so this I, up first. So no, I, I want, I want you to, to give the spoiler on this, but, but, but the one thing that's going to be strange about this, just that's worth pointing out, um, is that in the Iliad and the Odyssey, Homer only actually uses three color words. I don't, I don't mean that he only says them once each, but I mean, he only uses three color words and that most of the time when he's using, when he's speaking to do with what we might, we might think of color, um, it's not to do with the hue. It's to do with like its intensity. It's to do with some a sort of like physical perception or a certain aspect of the reality of the thing that's being communicated. But um, he's not really very interested in giving like a color based explanation of what's happening. Um, and of course the most famous one of this, I want you to be the one to say, cause I know you're passionate about it. Sure. Yeah. Well, well this is flummoxed researchers and I'm glad we're starting this off. Um, cause people have some wild ass theories on it. Yeah. But, um, 
basically there there are several instances in both the Iliad and the Odyssey where Homer refers to the sea as being wine dark. And this has flummoxed people, creating crazy theories as to why he would refer to the sea as being uh, colorfully or hue or you know in a hue of wine. Um, some you know there's there's sort of an archaeological theory that says oh well maybe they were diluting their wine with like a ton of water um there's so there's it turned the, it turned from purple to red to blue right. don't ask okay just don't right. ask because water isn't clear it's blue yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and then and then there's uh the the wildest theory which is like obviously the most popular to share because it's just stupid, but also the most easily debunkable is that either Homer himself was blind and didn't know what colors were or that people in ancient Greece had different cones in their eyes. Oh, this than is we my do favorite. To perceive color differently. Yeah. Now, the first one you can dismiss uh, easily because Homer actually does refer to other colors accurately. Um, and uh, the second one you can dismiss because uh, anyone who would think that is an idiot. Yeah, um, like basically, it's so, entirely, it's entirely like scientifically uh, false. Everything about it is 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 demonstrably false. It sort of emerges from, especially these kind of nineteenth century um, uh, ethno and cultural centric notions of like the the ever ever increasing progress of of uh, humanity. You know, um, right, which, right. A lot which, of the stuff we were talking about the mermaids episode where we we just look back at anyone from the past. Oh my gosh, how dumb they are. Yeah. Yeah. They're so Uh dumb. They literally can't even see blue, you know? Yeah. Um, Yeah. But you get, but it is weird, right? So, so yeah. So this is good. Like to point those out that like these people have serious people have seriously proposed this and they are incredibly dumb with that respect. Um, But there do, you do get these weird things, right? So you get the famous epithet of the wine dark sea. Um, also other, other texts in, um, in the ancient Greek corpus um, will describe physical objects whose color palette can't really have changed so like flowers like the iris um or a periwinkle or corn flowers which are like what they are blue you know there's like a corn flower blue it's a color you know periwinkle blue right um they're described by colors that clearly mean like red and green and black right um yeah and the sea and the sky them both uh both um will be very frequently described um with frankly any color except absolutely never blue right now some of this can be accounted for and and now we're going to get into some color theory stuff but, uh, but i promise it won't be too too boring some of this can be accounted for the fact that when we talk about colors most people think we're talking about pigments and shades but there's a lot more that goes into color than that there's also hue and there's tone and there's uh saturation level desaturation level so you know think about it this is this is something that like a lot of people will learn in sort of introductory art lessons but but think of just black like a black and white photo right you can make out the details in a black and white photo because you're seeing differences in saturation and contrast and hue across those things. If I were to color that black and white photo, the whole thing blue or the whole thing red or the whole thing green, you would still see all those individual details because of those differences in hue and contrast. And a lot of cultures other than Anglo ones, um, other than modern ones view color, um, more according to hues than they do according to shades or pigments. So um, a, a, a thing of a certain darkness of a certain hue, whether that's wine or a stormy sea, could be in some cultures considered to be basically the same color because they share the same hue. If you were to render them out in black and white, they'd be the same color intensity. They'd be that same kind of darkness. And this is why he's not saying wine red sea. He's saying wine dark sea, right? Right. He's making a statement about hue. But there's a really other, much more interesting component to this that I think is fundamental to the identity of the color blue and about society's relationship to the color blue and the art world's relationship with color blue, which is that We're going to go, we're going to, here's, here's where I'm going to chime in as a psych guy, as a, as a counselor guy. Turns out there is a very compelling theory and a very compelling argument to be made that human beings aren't actually capable of seeing colors that they don't have words for. 
Mm. And and th- this has been this was theorized originally in regards to things like you know wine dark sea, but it has been discovered since then that that this is actually observably true. So there's there's a a tribe called the Himba in Namibia, and they don't see blue. Uh, they're they've they've done studies with them where they will show them kind of a circle made out of different colors. Um, and there'll be like six green, let's say six or eight green squares, and then one blue square. And they will not be able to identify the blue square amidst all these other squares because they don't have a word for blue, but they do have like 18 different words for different shades of green. And they will show the same circle with all these different shades of green to the Himba tribe, and they will be able to identify each individual square as totally different. They've shown that same circle of squares to Americans, and none of them, including me, can tell the difference between any of these greens. Oh, interesting. Oh, interesting. Right? Yeah, sure. And, and and what we find is that there is actually anthropological development where different cultures view different colors based on necessity. The Himba, as a pastoral culture, have a need, have a usefulness behind being able to identify different types of green because of plant life and things like this that you and I don't need to have. Um, So why then would this argument, why would this theory that I can't see colors that I don't have a word for, and I don't need a word for a color that I don't need, why would that be so fundamental to the identity of blue and why blue is important and why conversations on colors like the ones we're having have to start with blue? Because it turns out that blue is actually the last color word to develop pretty much in almost any language. Right, right. Because it turns out there's actually no need to define blue at all. I need to find red because it's blood. And if my buddy is bleeding, I need to be able to run back to the tribe and tell everybody. I need to be able to define, you know, green because of sickness and toxicity and also health of plant life. I need to be able to find brown for the same reason. These are all colors that get identified very, very early on when you look at the way language and color language develops in any given culture, in any given society since the beginning of time. Blue always develops last because why the hell would I need to identify blue? Right. I can say the water is clear and that's how I know it's healthy. I don't need to say it's blue. Right. There's no reason to define blue at all outside. And this is where our conversation picks up outside of art, because once a culture starts becoming wealthy and fancy enough, now we can start manufacturing blue paint, which we're going to get into why that's rare and all this stuff pretty much in a second. But that's when the word develops. And so this is why I think that a, that a conversation about color has to start with blue because blue is the only color that is only associated with art. All the other colors have a practical application outside of, of their artistic use, but blue until I have a need for art, I don't have a need for blue. And so they kind of become one of the same thing. And I just think that's really, really cool. Yeah, I okay, I admit I reject as a linguistic like as a linguistics argument that like you only cre- you can only perceive things that have that you have words for that like this is one to one between like concepts and concepts and language. I mean that yeah, is a, a linguistic theory. it is a linguistic theory. Uh I don't really hold to it. Like part of its part of its basis is this very flawed with um the actually not just flawed it has been shown to be a f- an actual fraud um the f- the the scientific fraud of the like um whatever 110 eskimo words for snow right um oh sure yeah yeah uh which was a major major basis kind of conceptual basis in the early 20th century for for this kind of linguistic theory that like you have to have a word for something that, that like the need and in emplacement in, in something creates like ever subtler uh words for it um that whole thing turns out to have been made up um, like the like the literal the study everything about it was made up. Uh, I mean, right, if, that like, that that you know, one was yeah the Himba um, tribe thing. I think is is accurate. Yeah, but yeah, anyway, then that yeah. may will be so, so. But I'm just saying that like I think it's a little bit too much to, to just say uh like it's 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 more you can't just say a one to one like um right right that rea- would be reality concept yeah. word you know like uh, I I I would 
I think there's an important clarification to or or subtlety to introduce to say that like um we are perceiving it um how much uh, I'm willing to like single it out or interested in singling it out or able to single it out on its own uh, in the way that somebody who has a, like a fully defined concept that they frequently use um, that I may not be able to. Um, sure, but, like, sure. No, that's fair. And that's a fair you know, nuance, right? And I mean, this is something that I see all the time as a therapist where I will ask someone, how are you feeling? And they will say either I'm fine or I'm angry. <laughs> right. And it's because they don't, they haven't re I mean, does that mean they're not feeling sad? Does that mean they're not feeling scared that they're not capable of those feelings? Of course right. not they're capable of those things. But they they haven't they don't have a emotional language to be able to separate out and distinguish between individual emotional experiences. And so everything gets lumped into I'm fine or I'm angry. Or I'm angry. Yeah. So it's, so it's like, less so an ability and it's more a consciousness. That's a good nuance. I, to yeah, I think that's just important because like I don't wanna I don't wanna back backdoor allow in the like the ancient Greeks couldn't see blue idea. Sure, sure, um, sure. You no, know, no, that's that's I, really I, valuable. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I think yeah. it's just much more important to say like, oh, well, it, but basically, it's just a shade. Uh, it's it, we, we would just say, oh, it's just the tail end of green, possibly or red or black, actually, because uh, like, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of evidence that like in um, uh, until the in most of the maybe before the, the first millennium after Christ, et cetera, like um, heavily linked with black, you know, so you just say like, well, it's just, it's, you know, it's the tail end of black, you know? So right, like, well, right, right. well, what's the color of this? You'd say like, well, it's black, you know? And like, I mean, this is why, you know, how many, how many times have I had arguments with people about like whether the pants I'm wearing are black or blue, you know? And it's just like, well, probably you, not at all since you wear the same outfit over and over. I, well, day, I used to though. This I is used a to, right? relatable like, experience. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, exactly. But like, but guys, this is, I'm wearing, these are, these are black pants. And then like, I remember this happened in college one time and then, uh, some female friends of mine were like, yeah, but those are blue though. And I was like, so angry because like, no, these are, these are black pants, you know? But of course, like I saw the same color they did. It's just that to, to me, um, uh, I thought it was like silly and ridiculous to like over precise, um, like shades that I was practically using, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so for me, like, I didn't care to, to make the concept of black any more precise that would draw a clear division between like deep black deep blue and black you know yeah, that's a really good experiential example yeah 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 and i just think it's similar with like the with with like colors for green and stuff um but you know be, because and and the, and just another point to say like as a like the necessity thing is very fruitful and I don't want to and like that that example that you gave with this with this tribe is re, is a really fruitful and, uh, and fascinating one um but I do think there has to be something more than necessity like anthropological or or evolutionary biological necessity um because for instance like what let's well let's just think about english right i mean uh i uh, obviously ireland is not uh English was not the first language that was developing in uh, in what's now Ireland, uh, but it has been there for a, for a fairly long time, uh, and you know we call it like the Emerald Isle and all of this as it's, it's you know it's just like this like splendidly over rich um, saturation with all all these different like um, hyper rich shades of green and all these kinds of things. Um, it, they spoke in English as a primary language there for for quite a long time, and we still only really have one word for green. Hmm. You know, so I'm just saying that, that I think that there is more there is more to it than that. And of course, we of course, that's not quite true. We have a lot of words for green. It's just that they mostly live in like color palette manuals and right, like right. They, they're yeah, specialist Pantone words. books and Crayola boxes. Exactly. Yeah, they're, they're not common words. parlances. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I mean, to be honest, this is really embarrassing. I can literally never remember what color heliotrope is. Like, is, is heliotrope <laughs> like a bright green or a bright yellow or bright red? I, I thought heliotrope was a, was a blimp of some sort. Yeah, there so. it is. See, exactly. So, um, so anyway, I do think that there's something, uh, the reason I want to like, sort of point to that is just to recognize like how cultural this is that like cultures will like will develop specificities for things um in ways that i don't want to just reduce to anthropological like necessity um because i also for instance like what also about just like the joy of it the splendor of it like i want to be maybe if i'm a member of this tribe like i want to be able um to like speak in a language of of uh, uh love like the, with the clarity of love about the difference between like the overside of a leaf and the underside of a leaf and I want to be mm -hmm. able to have different words for that so that I can I, I can I can tell you um, how beautiful this thing is, you know, with a clarity. I can't just say if it's like light green or dark green. 
So I'm going to, I'm going to quote you here. I'm going to do the thing that you literally always do when I make a point like this in a podcast. I'm just going to say, yeah, no, actually, I think that's, I think that's really right. I think <laughs> yes, that's really I right. It. Actually, I'm very quotable um, as being completely useless. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But, but you're, you're making a really good distinction here. So I, and I, I apologize. It was not my intention to in any way imply a purely utilitarian thing. And I also think you're right to clarify something that, that I was assuming was clear but but you're right which was not at all which is that you know it's not per my example about being able to differentiate between different feelings and not just angry and fine you know it's about a level of consciousness and and almost if this is not too douchey a terminology it's almost like a level of connoisseurship right where where if i'm a connoisseur of different wines i'm able to tell the subtle differences between wine but if i don't care about wine then I was just going to tell you it's red or white, right? And if I'm a connoisseur of feelings, I'm able to say, I feel melancholic today versus I feel angry versus I feel frustrated. And these are all different experiences. And if I'm a connoisseur of colors, I'm going to tell you the difference between, you know, uh, uh, vermilion and, you know, whatever, right? Um, Heliotrope. Heliotrope. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and, um, and so I think you're right to say that. No, I think that there's, to go back to the necessity argument, the utilitarian argument, you know, a culture that doesn't put a high emphasis on the arts doesn't have either the necessity, the utilitarian necessity, or just the emotional desire for connoisseurship to dictate defining and differentiating some of these colors. So I think that's kind of the bridge between the two thoughts that we're having. Um, But either way, does still that pipe does end up putting us out at a place where blue doesn't exist a lot of places right right they a lot of people don't give a shit about blue right and then suddenly suddenly everyone gives so much of a shit about blue <laughs> Can I, let me let me interject with a quick story and then i want to talk about uh, an, an interesting case case point there which is um so- Okay, so this uh, a friend of mine uh, in the Dominicans was once uh, attending uh, an ordination yeah, a Dominican or of Dominicans in France, I think, and like he didn't speak. This is the ceremony by which a person becomes a priest. Becomes a priest, yeah, and so he didn't really speak French. He was there for complicated reasons, and uh, and he's sort of standing. There's a big celebration afterwards because it's a very exciting thing, and um, and he's standing there at this like table where there's like glasses of wine you know um and he's he's just feeling kind of like he's just standing there sipping sipping some wine by himself because he doesn't speak any of the languages that people people are speaking around him and this this french dominican comes up to him and starts and like he's, he's generous you know he feels pity for him so he wants to talk with him a little bit in you know in in his english um <laughs> But the only thing you can think to say is they're standing next to this table with all this wine on it and they're both holding wine. And the French guy turns to him and he says, <laughs> you know, of course, something like, do you like the wine? And he says, yeah, I like the wine. It's great. And he looks at him. He says, did you know it comes in colors? <laughs> <laughs> he said, he said, what do you think? I just wanted some wine colored wine. <laughs> Oh my God, that so, is a perfect intersection of what I'm trying to describe there. You're right. This yeah. is exactly what it is. so. Yes. Yeah, so so apparently, uh, at least this this French man's thought was that Americans literally could not tell the difference between red and white wine. Um, maybe because we don't famously, have enough love for it. Yeah, because we don't have enough love. There is a whole song by Billy Joel that just is about the differences between red and white. But <laughs> That's amazing. I guess <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> bottle of red, bottle of wine. Yes, yeah, it's from an Italian restaurant. Um, not a French restaurant, though. Just an Italian. There are only two different so, kinds in, in yeah, Italian exactly restaurants. Right. So listen, I want to tell this. So there's an interesting kind of like test case or or or, or like study case, I guess. So you know, you mentioned this uh, contemporary anthropological study of the tribe, which is super fruitful. Um, here's an interesting case though of like you say like when people kind of discover blue and it's like uh when they have this sort of luxury to do so and they're making making when they're using it to make beautiful art and things um which is oftentimes true um how like how are the romans like the like like of um the late republican era and the early and and well and and the, the early imperial era so like the turn of the of the eras between BC and AD. Um, how do they, how are they most familiar with the color blue? 
well, it should be a warning that they are aware of it. I mean, they have like a bunch of different words for it and none of them are really clear, um, but they hate it. Like the oh abs- really yes they absolutely hate it so um they uh um famously I uh, like if um you can tell from sort of like parodic literature I uh, I uh, and and various things that like I uh, you know I. Uh, Racists in the late 19th and, and mid 20th century will be embarrassed by this, but um, uh, having blue eyes was considered like almost like a physical deformity. Like it was like a bad thing. Like people look like monsters if they had blue eyes. Again, now we're talking about like the the um, I mean the people who now occupy like the the country of Italy are not very much the same as they were then. But you know, in any case, they just wouldn't have had blue eyes really. Um, mm-hmm. I. Blue was like for for um for men, it generally meant that like they had like bad a bad character for women, it meant that they were probably loose loose morals and like they they actually they just thought it was horrible so there and there are all these great texts um about it about how bad it is and what a horrible color it is and how nobody should wear it and nobody would wear it no decent person ever would wear it and the reason is because who did wear blue the barbarians. Oh and they shit, here didn't, we go. They didn't really wear blue exactly. Um but the Celts and the you know Germanic peoples um the northern peoples uh in you know like the 1st century BC and the 1st century AD um would dye their bodies blue before battle among other right, things. Yeah. And this gets um this gets like deeply, deeply, deeply associated in the like late Republican and early imp- an early imperial Roman idea uh, about the color blue because like again they don't have any they don't have any strong um uh, cultural use of it um and like cultural kind of value and appropriate and and uh, and sense of it uh, mm-hmm. and these barbarians uh, you know about, where there's there's wars right i mean there's important important texts written about these important wars with these people um who like paint their bodies blue and then you get so yeah. we, like we know that they actually do paint their bodies blue using woad um from yeah a, woad that's the word for it yeah whoa dang yeah um <laughs> so it's uh it's it's keanu reeves favorite favorite color woad um <laughs> and, woad. Woad. dude woad. dude something strange <laughs> happening at the circle k <laughs> so like uh and then of course you get these you get these hilarious sort of like mm, uh exoticizing sort of like fantasizing ideas about it so um uh Pliny I actually don't know which Pliny whether it's the elder or the younger but um I uh, or the middle aged Pliny or the middle yeah they're just the, just the middle Pliny who knows um he, he said that uh that um uh women from Brittany, which is Celtic, you know, um mm-hmm. especially at the time, uh, that they would paint their bodies blue and then have gross orgies. Oh, so gross. It's so gross. It's so just like woad and nasty. So woad, yeah, that's right. <laughs> just just woad. So yeah, like so this is but this is basically like a I mean again, I want to be reductionistic, but like this is a big part of why like fancy roman society thought the blue was a color you just don't do that is fascinating especially because because you're sort of jumping us forward with with rome um i didn't know any of what you just said i mean obviously i knew all about the woad stuff i didn't know about rome's perception of woad and and why that would taint no pun intended their their perception of of the color um I mean, it makes sense, right? And it, and you're you're opening us up to a larger conversation that I think is important here, um, especially with blue, because of our associations with blue as a color of sadness, right? Um, and then we'll talk more about w- why that is. But you're opening us up to a larger conversation about how different cultures associate different values, emotions, perspectives with a certain color. I'm surprised that that's Rome's experience. That would not be what I inferred because blue was so important to the ancient egyptians as a color of oh. refinery and wealth and um i would have just assumed and most of what i know about early uses of blue come from the early egyptian period um 
to about about a thousand years uh, before Christ. Um, well, you know, a thousand to eighteen hundred years before Christ, um, we're seeing blue as like the height of wealth. Um, and I would have just assumed that Rome would have adopted that. And I'm surprised that that's not the case. And maybe you can shed some more light on that. But before do you, know, you do, well, yeah, go ahead. Oh, just, just let, let me ask you, like, do you know, um, what were they using for blue? I mean, were they so, using lapis lazuli? They were, were they using sa- sapphire? Right. Or were they using? No, no, that's what they were using lapis lazuli. So, so, uh, and this is really, I'm glad you touched on that. Cause that's really the story of blue, right? Is that lapis lazuli is this. Um, semi-precious uh, stone, a what's uh, what's it called? A meta metamorphizing rock, I think is the word. I'm forgetting, but it's basically. Oh my a gosh, rock it's an animorph. What yes, does it turn an into? From the hit from the hit series of novels, Animorphs, I turn into a chipmunk <laughs> and fight crime. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, I forget the, the, the specific word, but it's when a rock is transitioning between two, t- uh, two mineral statuses. Um, anyway, so it's, it's this beautiful blue hued, gorgeous, semi-precious stone found primarily, um, or originally in Afghanistan that gets mined, uh, into Egypt. And they are one of the earliest cultures we know that has, um, really robust language, color language around blue. And Lapis oh, Leslie wow. becomes really, really important in the history of blue, into Christian art, um, into the proliferation of blue as a as a color. It's all Lapis Lazuli, all mined in Afghanistan in this one area. But the Egyptians are first to do it. They don't know how to make it into a pigment. Every time they try to make it into paint, it turns gray. But they do know mm. how to like apply it as a dust to shit. Um, leading to my first uh, example of my favorite use of the color blue. Um, are you familiar with William the Hippo? I am familiar with people named William, and I'm familiar with hippos. So Not I the can- same Damn thing. it. Oh, gosh. Not the same thing. Get out of here. Um, so William, the hippo is the unofficial mascot of the Met. We were talking about the Met Gala before the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art is, uh, their and, and history. Um, they, uh, they, uh, their unofficial mascot is William, the hippo. And, um, the reason for this is so, so he is this little, uh, stone hippo. Um, I forget if he's carved out of Lapis Lazuli or just covered in it, but oh, wow. he's this beautiful little blue hippo found in a tomb, um, in, uh, 1910 and they've carbon dated this back to between 1961 and 1878 BC. So again, about 18 here, 1800 years before Christ. Wow. And it is stunning. He's so cute. He's like legitimately really? adorable. He's like a little toy hippo, bright blue covered in, uh, engravings of Lotus flowers, which were seen oh, wow. as a symbol of rebirth and were also native to a hippo's habitat. And so, okay. uh, the hippo becomes the symbol of both in ancient Egyptian spirituality. So they find this little guy in a, a tomb in uh, 1910 by 1917, it becomes part of the Mets, uh, collection. And in 1931, uh, I think, um, this uh, British satire uh, magazine called Punch oh, decides yeah. to do a funny little article about this hippo where it was really popular because, you know, exoticism in the earlier part of the 1900s uh, was all about just Egyptian shit. Like, I just yeah, want yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone, everyone's and, everyone is all Egyptian everywhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. So people were buying all these prints of this hippo to frame in their homes in, in, in their, in its blue color. And punch does a satirical article about a family who names their print of the hippo, William. And Oh my gosh, really? And he is psychic and he tells them important pieces of life advice. And when they (laughs) ignore him, terrible things happen. So like he tells them, I don't approve of your summer vacation plans. I think they sound lame and bad. And they go, oh, we're not going to listen to the talking psychic hippo. So they go on the vacation anyway. And the vacation is a disaster. They get rained out. They have a terrible time. And so they come back and they say, we are so sorry, William the hippo. We will listen to you forever now. And so this ancient exoticism uh, (laughs) blue hippo becomes the personal sage of the family. Well, someone at the Met Gala thought this was freaking hilarious. They republish it and William the Hippo becomes just the name. Uh, and because of this article and uh, 
is basically their unofficial mascot even today. You can buy little William hippos in the gift shop at the mat and it's adorable and I want one so very, very, very much and I haven't gotten one yet. And if anyone's a fan of the podcast and has access to the mat and wants to send me one, I will love you forever and you'll be my best friend. Um, that said though, this is a really good example of blue as the height of elegance and wealth. You have a king who is being buried in a tomb and damn it, I need a blue hippo. Who is psychic and can, can tell me about hippo. whether right. my vacation is going to be because like rained out or not. that's the fanciest thing I can think of. And, yeah, and yeah. Lapis Lesley, I mean, does become a, a equivalent to gold throughout a large part of art history, both in ancient Egypt and then all the way into like medieval Christianity, um, which makes blue like the most extra fancy thing you can possibly have, you can possibly include in your art. And that leads to a lot of really funny things that I'm looking forward to talking about later in art history. But I think William is just a great uh, introduction to that idea. And it's why I'm so surprised that 1800 years later in Rome, they're just saying, ew, woad orgies. Because I'm thinking, <laughs> like, what about extra? I'm thinking, well, like, what about super extra fabulous Blue William just 1800 years ago? What the hell happened to they, him? They thought he was incent, you know, uh, telling people to have orgies, which are gross. Oh my um, God. What if that's the psychic advice he was giving to this guy? <laughs> that's why they're like, ignoring him. That's guys, they're ignoring have him. orgies. They're like, oh my goodness. Like, we don't want to do that. He's like, if you don't, I'm going to ruin your summer vacation. <laughs> I'm just going to go to Cornwall and get rained out. We should have had the orgies. <laughs> we should have had a woad orgy. Oh, woad no. orgies. I mean, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know where. Because obviously Rome gets a lot of stuff um, from Egypt. I mean, they have this kind of complicated love hate situation. Um, I like so the only the only major like extractable extractable. Uh, you got this. Don't hurt I yourself. I got it. Kid. I got it. It's, okay. Psych myself up. Uh, the only ex major extractable source of of blue that you get that's like native to like Western Europe is going to be like woad um and uh and that's mostly going to be more northerly anyway but okay there it is um like indigo also at the time period that you're talking about like in the like in the what i will officially dub the way back days um yeah, yeah i like indigo is a big deal um but like indigo doesn't grow in western europe indigo grows in like um africa and like the near east uh and the far east sure. Um, mm -hmm. and it turns out, uh, this is hilarious and it turns out in the new world, uh, but it just does not grow in Western Europe, um, which has this wild effect. I did not know this until I was looking up some stuff for this that, um, uh, so we would get brought to, um, you get these long trade routes that would bring you um indigo and it would get, so it would come into Europe. It's just that it was really expensive because it would be these long trade routes bringing it to you. And indigo also is mostly produced from the leaves of the indigo plant, um, a very mm -hmm. species of the indigo plant. Um, but right. you know, you also can't... produced by the band Indigo Girls. Yes, actually, that's the little known fact. They 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 are actually a source of indigo. Um, yeah. So you know that's why they stopped making music is so they could full time concentrate on excreting um, <laughs> dyes. Oh you know? God, why would you say excreting? <laughs> well, that I... made the joke so much worse. <laughs> You're oh, welcome. God, yeah, so it. that's good. It's just uh, make notes. You'll never get those images out of your mind. It's great. Um, but yeah, so like, how does indigo? physically arrive if you're just like hanging out say in like i don't know rome in like third century ad like how do you how do you just get how, how does it come to you well it comes to you pulverized so right turn into a powder um and like in big blocks so it right. looks kind of like it looks like a rock, like a soft rock that mm -hmm. you like knock bits off of. And then you like, you know, you try to pigmentize it. You would do whatever you're going to do with it. Um, but so it's really great because you have all of these um, for a long time. Actually, you have all of these um, Western European um, pigment theorists and people talking about like natural history and chemistry and stuff like this um, who are who all think that indigo is a mineral. 
Oh, fascinating! Because it only because they because it only comes to them in blocks, you know, right. um, like powder powdery blocks, and so they think it's a mineral. Uh, and you know, I'm sure people have kind of discover uh, that that's not the case as as time goes on. Uh, but the idea does persist, and people and like Western Europe only finally becomes like a hundred percent convinced that indigo is a plant and not a mineral with the when they go to the new world. That is insane. Yeah. I did not know that either. That's a long that's time. Really cool. That's a long time that's of being pretty sure that it's time. probably actually a mineral when in fact it's maybe actually technically speaking a plant. Wow. Which is like, and I bring this, like, a, a, it's hilarious uh, and kind of fun, uh, but be also just like, you know, if you can't just go to an art store and like pick up a tube of like blue um you know you have to be like there's all this material physical culture stuff about like oh my gosh this thing has to come from like india on uh people's and animals bodies like backs and stuff to from india wherever wherever it, or you know western china wherever it might be uh to get to like th- the trade fair outside of Saint Denis or something like this, you know, and like that's just expensive and it's hard and it's it's ridiculous. The whole process is gonna be really expensive, and so like, and you, along the way, you're not exactly gonna be asking like, yeah, but well, is this, would you call this a plant thingy yeah. or like a mineral thingy? It's more like, how can I bilk you down on the price of this right. thing, which is right. insanely expensive. <laughs> Right. And truly insanely expensive. And I'm glad you bring up the privilege that we have of being able to just go to an art store and pick up a tube of blue because it does add something important to the conversation um, that I want to get into uh, kind of in the history of the the pigment and the color. Um, Before we do that, though, speaking of art stores, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to uh, the fact that this podcast is is brought to you, our gentle listener, as Father Gabriel often calls you, um, by uh, the organization Catholic Creatives. And also Catholic dot store. So Catholic creatives, first of all, is an organization dedicated to igniting what they refer to as a new renaissance of faith through uh, prayer and beauty and the creative spirit. To do this, they connect uh, and support and promote different artists and innovators and storytellers, uh, makers from across the faith community. Um, And a great way to support those artists and to support the mission of Catholic creatives to help them put on the programs and summits and networking opportunities uh, that they do is to support this podcast on the Catholic creatives, Patreon. Um, so if you go to Catholic creatives.org forward slash support, you can sign up to give us just a very small tuppence, a bag and uh, directly be contributing not only to this podcast, uh, putting food on our tables and uh, additional identical smocks cassocks in uh, father gabriel's closet but you also contribute to um to these these ministries and resources that are so important to support uh local artists um additionally though you can you can take that extra step to support those artists by going to catholic.store where there is a delightfully curated selection of different uh, goods created by these kinds of makers and artisans that we've been describing uh, and you can support them directly through there uh, again you know we're talking about the privilege of being able to go down to your local store and buy a bottle of blue paint which is just the height of excess for any of the creatives and artists from history that we're going to be talking about today uh, don't let the fact that you have access to amazing art and art supplies and all this stuff be lost upon you be grateful for it support people who are using it uh go to catholic uh, dot store and catholiccreatives.org forward slash support to do your part for the art community today um okay so on blue paint and and picking up at the store um that gets us into the idea of paint itself uh, oh, cool. which is yeah. important yeah. right so as i said the egyptians they don't know how to turn this thing into paint they know to carve it off and apply it to stuff but as soon as you make it into a paint it goes gray um sidebar fun fact we've lost a lot of the uses of lapis lazuli in ancient egypt and didn't know where it was until a couple of years ago when it was discovered that it can uh reflect uh fluorescent light and so what? we're actually now able to shine fluorescent light across 
thousands and thousands of years old surfaces throughout ancient Egypt and see lapis lazuli reflected back at us. So that's pretty rad. Oh um, wow! But it's but it's lost least, its 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 uh its blue color. It's it's lost the yes. shade. We can't see it, but it reflects the light, so we can oh, see where it was, which is oh, really really fascinating. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but. Eventually, some people do figure out how to make uh, uh, in, into a paint, into a pigment. The first time we see this used is in the um, the 6th century BC by Buddhist monks. Um, they're able to harvest it in Afghanistan um, and turn it into a paint. Uh, and that just basically changes everything uh, forever. Once, once that technology is out of the bag, man, does everybody want them some blue? And nobody wants blue more then the Catholic church wants blue because uh, blue again is the equivalent of painting with gold. You cannot get nicer than gold leaf and blue and everybody wants them some. And so the, the transport and trade of lapis lazuli into Catholic medieval Europe after the sixth century becomes just I mean, the bee's knees, just the craziest thing. Um, and you start to see some really, really cool art coming out of this and art traditions that everybody's going to be really familiar with today. Um, why in ancient Egypt is the chief god Osiris blue? It's the same reason why the highest gods in, uh, in, in the Hindu faith are blue. It's the same reason why the Virgin Mary is always depicted in blue because blue is the fanciest shit you can buy. And so therefore <laughs> here's something about blue. It's fancy. Right. Okay. Deal with it. Right. And that's ultimate, but that's so cool that like most Catholic moms you meet, most little Christian people are gonna be like, Mary always wears blue and they don't know why. And it's literally just cause it was the nicest thing we had. Um, and so yeah. we're like, okay, yeah. Everything's going to be blue now, um, which leads me to a lot of other delightful examples. But uh, I'd seems but there, like you but there is a there. yeah, there is a weird thing about that, too, though, of course, because right, like um, Mary always wears blue because it's the fanciest thing and it's 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 expensive and everyone loves it, except for for the like hundreds of years when everyone in, the, in like most people in the West in like uh, sort of whatever fancy West uh, are convinced that only like nasty, disgusting, no clothes wearing barbarians. Yeah, help me. Yeah. So blue. help me satisfy this dissonance because uh, both are true and I'm not sure how both can be true. Yeah. Yeah. So um, basically um, they like anything with color, like we've been talking about, um, like uh, you can make you can recognize these cool like fascinating transcultural trans uh, you know or like through time um commonalities uh but they are also going to break down in critically important ways uh and that's like that's part of the fun of it um mm -hmm. so i uh, it's not always just that uh like blue is the fanciest and the hardest and the most expensive and so we prize it the most um it's not actually going to become the color of like nobility and like royal stuff. Um, like what does what color does a king wear? Well, like blue and like mad, rich, deep, beautiful blues. That's going to come out of the 12th century. Um, right. That's much later. Yeah. Yeah. Much, much, much later. So um, basically, uh, if we, uh, it just isn't actually prized in Western Europe for kind of a long time. Um, and, Mary doesn't wear blue for kind of a long time. Um, she can, she can, but she doesn't often like mostly when Mary is wearing blue in um, early Christian art and early medieval art. Um, she it's in mosaics um, in mosaics. She makes sure blue. So um, uh, if I'm remembering correctly in uh, Hagia Sophia, um, which is built um, in, in in the form that we know it um, in the um, mostly finished in the mid sixth century. Um, that uh, you'll see her in blue, but oftentimes, and this I'm actually this is I was talking about be arguing with with uh, with people about whether my jeans were black or blue, um, but oftentimes she's really wearing black. And even as I'm pulling up in my mind, like my mental register of images of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Hagia Sophia, um, actually 
to my eye, many of them are black. Um, and so we need to go back and review some of those uh, with your with your own actual eyes to see whether you think they're blue or black. Um, but that's often how it is. She's actually often wearing um, she's often wearing black um, or other colors. Um, the uh, um, like really early images of her. I mean, well, really early images are hard to say. Uh, possibly the, early, the earliest image that we have is from the like um, beginning of the third century. And uh, I think that's a red garment that she's wearing. But um, uh, it's a disputed image anyway. And um, but in any case, but she'll, she'll often wear dark clothing. So like black, brown, brown, black, brown, gray, these kinds of things um, that are especially associated with mourning. Um, sure, so there's a strong sure. sense of like Mary at the cross, you know, Mary in mourning, all these things. Um, I, yeah. So for a long time, like, does she wear blue? Does she not wear blue? Like, well, maybe in mosaics, she's much more likely to wear blue. Um, but like not actually, it's not really her color for, it's not really her color, you know, for kind of, <laughs> for kind of, a, for kind of a long time. Um, and, uh, a big, like, uh, we could get to the shift with like the, the the shift with Mary turns out to be the same shift as with everything about the Christian understanding of blue. Um, but if I could just point out to one kind of fascinating historical uh, one, one other kind of middle ground thing about it that, that um, yeah, yeah, by all means. is really, is really interesting here that um, so, okay. So again, like why do people in like the first century BC and the first century AD, like if you're living in Rome specifically, like why do you, think that blue is really crass and really gross like well it's because of obviously like the gross celts and the gross germanic tribes um and the gross woad um then <laughs> comes so like, much fun with this word <laughs> i literally cannot like have I, I mean i've been waiting my entire life to have an excuse to use the word woad this much um uh it's just amazing yeah um so i uh, then but like okay whatever skipping a bunch of important historical stuff like um, over the course of like into the sixth century, um, then a lot of power center kind of moves up in Europe. Uh, and, uh, and this is like what you call the Merovingian period. I know it's not always just the stupidest character from one of the stupidest matrix movies. Um, I, uh, but, um, uh, but it's this, so it's this era, like the sixth to the eighth century ish. And, um, when a lot of kind of political power is kind of beginning to concentrate uh, in kind of Northern uh, central and Western Europe. And um, there in this kind of Merovingian period, which I mean, it's a little, it's a little awkward to say it, but like there is a lot of what previously would have been called barbarians who are con calling all the shots, you know? Right. Um, yeah. The barbarians have done a little bit of a come up. They have, yeah, they have done a little bit of the conquering of large swaths of the culture, and then they have themselves been conquered over and over and over and over and over again. It's just a big hot mess for a few hundred years, and like everything's fun. Um, but in that period, um, it's a big deal to like wear. It, it's a big, it's a big deal. Like a blue for fabrics is uh, is is quite common, and it's common in nobility and all this kind of stuff. So it's it's um, it's a it's a color of fanciness. Um, the next period, which is kind of my period, like the Carolingian period, so that's going to be like the 8th and the 9th um, century, somewhat into the 10th if you want to, um, totally drops out. Blue becomes like so passe, so fast, like it vanishes from the imperial from the from the Carolingian court, um, what becomes the imperial court, um, and like only trashy, gross peasants wear blue. And why is that? Because they are not barbarians, damn it! We are okay. Important. So there's so there's this new wealth kind of keeping up with the Kardashians thing, where they're like, "Well, that's what we used to do when we were poor." It so was now like we're not so gonna do it gross. Anymore. Remember when people were like, "Oh my woad," and like, "Oh my gosh," but um, we're not doing that anymore <laughs> because, like, after after you know. Uh, December twenty fourth, eight hundred, when um when Charlemagne suddenly becomes the emperor, um, ain't nobody wearing blue no more. You know that's, that's so fascinating because because you are talking about an anthropological reality that I wasn't as familiar with color and textile wise, but which I am more familiar with in terms of like warfare, where 
part of the reason the Vikings, for instance, are so traumatic to the European mind is because the Vikings are doing all these things that the people they're attacking were doing maybe up to a hundred years before. And they're all saying like, oh, we are more evolved than that. We, we, we don't go to people's weddings and just cut their heads off anymore. Like we're civilized. We're yeah, cool. We don't the do that weird Game of Thrones now. stuff. We don't do right. it now. We've pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We're all classy now. And the Vikings show up and remind them of their own past. And there's this existential threat where they're like, are we not as evolved as we thought we were as a society? And that's interesting. Also, that could you please stop stealing get- all of my things? That would be right. great. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. Um, and 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 I, it's interesting that color would be lumped in. Of course it would, but it doesn't. Of course it would. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you know, but you're totally right. Um, yeah. And I just so but again, like this is why it's just kind of fun to pay attention to the way that like um there are really cool broad trends and broad, um, uh, broadly recognizable patterns that are kind of shocking actually with the color blue. Um, that it's so you know, that there are these really wild intercultural and then like across time kind of connections that you can draw through through times and places that don't seem to be very similar. Um, but there are also super dramatic discontinuities in Seizurai that are also like really worth paying attention to. Another good word, Seizurai. Um, what, okay, so in your perspective, either in your opinion or in what you've you've learned in prep for the episode, what then pivots that shift from ew, blue people, are gross and poor and we're not like them anymore to um blue should be everywhere and and mary is blue all the time in in our in our catholic sort of uh royal courts and churches and things like this because that definitely does become an artistic revolution at some point right exactly so apparently like the big shift in christian art to um in ways that we can recognize with like physical ma- physical materials it will like beginning to use the color blue um and be pretty jazzed about it all things considered um apparently that's like really kind of happening in the 11th century um mm-hmm. is that people start to use blue more and more broadly um for a long time or for a while um you're seeing like these really like clearly prized and like beautiful uses of blue in manuscript illuminations like in the carolingian period and beyond you'll so that's like the eighth ninth century and beyond um and there's a few reasons for that like one is that it does create this like really insanely rich and beautiful color um uh it's also insanely insanely expensive and so you you put it into really small spaces, right? Like a manuscript illumination, even a really, really, really big one. It's probably only going to be a few inches, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. especially this time period. Um, And uh, I mean, I guess you can get a whole, a whole folio page sometimes, but that's really unusual. Um, And uh, so, yeah, so you just put it like highlights or like this little thing of an, of an illumination and it's cool and all of this. Um, there's technological stuff like if over the course of, of like the Middle Ages, um, people develop different technologies for like extracting um, the, the blue part of the lapis lazuli and making it more intense and stuff like this. But anyway, yeah, case, there's like, like certain chemical reactions that happen when you mix animal blood into it and things like this. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And like wax apparently in soap and like, anyway, yeah. So like there's, so, so there's, there's some of it, some of it's technological. If like we technical. got it, throw that shit in the throw blue it. and see what <laughs> <Yes>. happens. <laughs> okay. Steve peed the blue. <laughs> he freaking ruined it. <laughs> I'm just imagining a monk just like, crossing out piss on a chalkboard like <laughs> that does not make the blue better uh let's look at animal blood now let's do okay. that just so, crossing things off it's got as, this disgusting disgusting smiley face you know it's yeah like, exactly Check actually mark. wax smiley face wax yes works great deer stars. blood works great yeah it's I'm freaking great it. Two gold like, stars. nobody's allowed to piss in the, in the lapis lazuli ever again <laughs> <laughs> it cost me so much money uh, oh my lord but yeah, apparently a big shift for this is that um, is so that's happening over the ele- course of the 11th century. People start to begin to use it more. There are some te- some technological technical changes um, that are beginning to shift this, um, and then like I. Uh, I'm not at all trying to re- reduce. There's no way I would want to cause it reduce it to one person, but like um, the like a clear turning point. Um, 
that uh, that the one scholar that I was looking at um, points to uh, that's believable as at least a witness to a big turning point um, was um, there is this very influential um, patron of the arts in the mid 12th century uh, named Suget, Abbot Suget of Saint Denis. So he dies in like 1151. Um, he's this major, major, major patron of the arts, um, commissioning all kinds of stuff. He left behind this like long kind of rambly, um, like here's all the shit in my monastery kind of like review um, that also among its like whatever 500 pages includes this like really, 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 really interesting like discussion of art and like what art is and how art works and these kinds That's of so things. so awesome. He's like cataloging his personal museum, but also throwing in ridiculously cool philosophy just mixed in. It's just mixed in because why not? It, 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 I, I mentioned that just because like I... Because it's there your personal life no, goal. I, I, I believe that. Well, yes, obviously. Like, I believe that there there might not actually be a complete. Well, there's certainly no complete translation of the whole work. Um, mostly you just you'll find in like our history um, books and like history of Christian responses to art and stuff like that. You'll find like that 20 page section excerpted. Um, and one of my professors pointed out like guys this is like nobody in history would have ever experienced like it makes it seem like uh abit, abit sujet was this like big art theorist like nobody in history ever would have experienced it like that because you have to wade through like 500 pages of like on the top left plinth you will find you know right um, it's basically and- it's literally a dewey decimal sort of museum cataloging of our artifacts and then occasionally in the margins he's throwing in this kind Have of you thing ever so like yes. the stars exactly but so you know his theory may not have been like super well known um per se but he was a super super influential um patron of the arts and theorist of the arts in the in the sense of like just really practical like a lot of what he he was talking with all the most important and famous people of his day um and having arguments with them Bernard of clairvaux hated him um he didn't Ooh, care interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, Burn is a fascinating figure, and um, uh, anyway, he he a lot of things that he talks about, we begin to see very dramatically playing out um, in like uh, early Gothic. So people like t- t- associate the Gothic with like the 1130s. Um, he's right in like the 1130s, 1140s. Um, you you start to see like the stuff that he was kind of talking about in this um, like a little blurb in his like here's all my stuff catalog um you see it like really dramatically playing out um through the through the gothic period so like was it directly coming from him like i don't really know but it doesn't matter the point is he's testifying to his presence and um one huge thing with him is he's the first big guy to make this really big radical change where now he's not just like well blue you know i mean like scary demons with blue eyes and like nasty orgy cults from you know Brittany um and like murder machines from scandinavia uh he has this big idea that like blue is the color of heaven oh sure that makes sense yeah so like um at least as as far as i understand it like the first and clearest textual witness to uh a a theorizing of this and a connecting of it with like biblical passages talking about sapphire and lapis lazuli um is in this in the works of um abbot sujet um and he has this really really strong idea that like blue is this like blue um, is the warmest color blue is the warmest <laughs> color. i mean of course like people do actually think it's a warm color like we say like, it's cool, no no i'm blue, kidding it's, you know, a, but it's a that's independent a- french lesbian film blue is the warmest color sorry i'm being i'm being oh, annoying babe there we go classic um yeah. uh, it's, yes you learn something the more you know <laughs> do, do, do. yeah you see listen this is, a, this is an important theme the more you know all right um yeah so he just has this really strong idea that it's like it's the purest possible visual expression of the sacred you know um and that like it's somehow uniquely con- connected with the radiance of god that like it spreads its radiance that um that like this is the color of heaven and where whatever you have in it is the color of heaven um the other really 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 important influence that's happening at the same time is that the 12th century is the century of the virgin mary in the we- in western europe so like the 12th century is the century where like devotion to Mary goes from like pe- something that people are pretty into, you know, I mean, the earliest prayer we have uh, like 
to the Virgin Mary um, is from the I forget if it's, it's I, I think it's two sixteen. Um, yes, early. Uh, so he, super early, you know. Um, so it's we have devotion to the Virgin Mary. Um, early early you know personal intimate intimate devotion speaking prayers to her directly these kinds of things um but it becomes like all the rage like all the everybody's rage in the 12th century fascinating and the two of these movements get paired up we literally do not have time to explore this at all but i i am fascinated maybe we can talk about this off here i'm fascinated why because Bernard of Clairvaux, St. Bernard of Clairvaux is obviously instrumental in this proliferation of Mary as being just the coolest thing since sliced bread. And it's fascinating to me that this this abbot and he would be at each other's throats when they both ultimately end up making such an impact on the way the broader culture sees Mary. God, that would be fascinating to talk about. We'll have to save it for later. Um, but regardless, that's okay. No, that makes sense. Do you... Because okay, so I had you you had jumped us way too far by bringing up Rome, and then I I rewound us to Egypt, and then I returned the favor favor by jumping us from literally the sixth century Buddhist monks in Afghanistan to the thirteen hundreds, and you're like, whoa, 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 let's rewind and talk about all that bullshit in between there. So we've now both done the same thing to each other, but to cut back to the jump forward, I did. Uh, I'm sure. I mean, you are not denying that the economic rarity and value of of lapis lazuli as being a gold-like thing also plays a role in this right or or are you do oh, you yeah. think no, that no, that no. is being no, overstated it totally does it's just that that's not a it's i would say that's a necessary but not sufficient condition for it becoming um associated with the wealthy um, sure, okay. because that is always the case in western europe it's always the case that it's fancy and expensive fancy in the sense of expensive but it only becomes fancy in the sense of like like girl i want to wear that um in like the 12th it, like basically kind of actually like and i'm this is not causal i'm not saying it's causal but just like one thing and then another sort of after the blessed virgin mary is just like always draped in blue mm -hmm. then all the kings and queens want to be draped in blue i'm not saying it's causal i'm not saying it's causal. i don't think it is but it is around the same time like it, it so, kind of happens in that order so y i don't I, I am sure you're going to step in and tell me that this is wrong. This is, I'm yes, just yes, yes, purely yes, 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 spitting yes, yes. this out. And it's your favorite thing to do. I, I, so I'm purely spitting this out as a theory, but something we've talked about, we talked about this in mermaids. We talked about this in kitsch. We talked about this all the time is this Catholic philosophical obsession with the contrast and ultimately uniting of the sacred and the profane, the, the physical and the messy with the beautiful and the celestial um and and how much art gets you know just comes out of this idea and exploring this idea and that this is very very fundamental to the catholic consciousness and the catholic what's called the catholic imagination right is there anything to be said or is it purely just coincidental is there anything to be said of this cultural memory that people have of blue as something that crass low orgy people have and then i mean if you know anything about bernard of clairvaux right at the at the time at which this abbot you're talking about and bernard of clairvaux are at each other's throats bernard of clairvaux is trying to proliferate this idea of mary as and her sexuality as being something really 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 important and sacred so like the term our lady which we now use only speaking about Mary at that time is primarily a term used like in a flirty way with like loose women and prostitutes. And so he, he coins that for our lady. He's focusing on um, the breastfeeding of Mary. And so like the sexuality and the physicality and the viscerality of, of Mary is really important. Is it purely coincidental that blue is being then used at that point or is there some element of cultural memory of blue being the color of that viscerality too that's being brought into this yeah well we you know what like um let me just like throw some shade and then say that we should like we just have to have this as a whole topic of a different conversation because sure, um those things are happening in the 12th century um they don't actually at the time 
they are considered bodily and physical, but not sexual. And that's like a whole fascinating thing. Right. Um, no, that's a good, and, that's a really and good I'd distinction like, to make. Like I would, well, let's just, let's just make a mental note, like cross out. We're not going to talk about piss, but cross out, probably not going to talk about animal blood. Talk about like sexuality, like uh, sexual expressions of Christ and the Virgin Mary in the 12th century, like smiley face check mark let's talk about that but let's have that be a whole conversation because otherwise That's we're gonna, gonna get way lost conversation yeah. yeah 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 it's like super it's super boss and there's a lot of cool stuff to say about that historically um but i just say like um there are some really interesting qualification about that and like ultimately like for ne- right now we can just say that they're doing very different things um okay. or you could say that like that can go so many different directions the sujet is like let let's just like cover the church in images of the virgin mary like draped in blue and bernard clairvaux says like how about we have absolutely no images in our church of any kind whatsoever except for you can have exactly one statue of the virgin mary and it cannot be painted by <laughs> <laughs> and that's like i mean yeah that like that literally happened so there it is <laughs> that's fascinating and then of course you know 500 years later we just sort of streamline these things into one consistent narrative and it's just oh this is just what we do now mary's everywhere and she's blue but also she's always depicted the way bernard of clairvaux said she should be and it's just it's, it's fascinating. just so great it's so great <laughs> um okay so cover you say covering the church with images of our lady and covering the church with with blue that then brings me into my second after william the psychic hippo that yes. brings me into my second favorite not second favorite but like second in my order of favorites uh example historical example of blue which is and help me with the pronunciation here but the, uh, the well the, it's the arena chapel um but the uh are you familiar with the arena chapel it's it's the uh, the the scriveni the scriveni in um in uh padua in veneto italy uh it's an augustinian monastery and okay, it was this is, i'm not familiar with this okay it's you have to see this so it, look it up it's amazing the entire freaking thing is blue it's designed in 1305 or finished in 1305 uh giotto is the artist who does all this oh he's so he's the best he's the best and he, they literally are just like we want to make here's the prompt giotto we want to make the most extra church of all time and i realize that we're living in italy so we got to like really pump up the extra like right. extra extra so so again 1305 right our 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 artistic characters are not overly expressive serene byzantine depictions are really really favored um and judd is like okay what if i made the entire church lapis lazuli the entire thing and then Guys, cover you're it gonna in- love i got the biggest deal on this it's only gonna cost a hundred <laughs> billion dollars like actually don't worry got elon musk said he was gonna like sell twitter just so we right. can build this church just it's to gonna be so good the sheer amount of blue and then let's cover that blue with gold leaf stars so here's your I, thing which at this point heaven. is basically cheap actually how could how can we afford not to how can we afford not right to? it's you like know? sprinkles at this point um and then he does the entire thing as sort of a comic book panel of the life of Christ with the most counterculturally expressive figures you will see during that period. Um, like the faces are so emotionally expressive. The postures are as stereotypically Italian bippity boppity boopity as you possibly can get. You, huh? I mean, Martha, Martha in the resurrection of Lazarus is literally holding her nose because she's afraid of the tomb being open and the stench of the dead. So there, there are, there are legit, like a lot of representations of, of, uh, of Martha holding her nose. It's really yeah, boss. Yeah, the, yeah. They're so but, good. But I mean, really like the emotions depicted here are not culturally popular at this time. And what I love about it coming in from a psych place and also an art place is for me, and maybe I'm reading too much into this, but for me, the arena chapel is a really good example of kind of the extraness of blue now becoming associated with the, uh, the, the, what's the, the vividity, vividity, I guess of emotion, right? Yeah. Blue oh, and cool, emotion sure. are getting paired together. Wow. Look how extra and vivid and intense the blue is and look how expressive and emotional the figures are. And that I dig because now we're, we're turning from gross woad orgies. It's the sky and the heavens. It's the fancy thing to do to now there's kind of an emotional 
association with this color. It's intense. And right now in our present culture, we think of red as just like passion and fiery, but, but there's blue is being used this way now. And red at this time is earthiness, right? There's juxtaposition of Mary by this point. She's always in blue because we were trying to represent Christ coming from a celestial place. But Christ himself is always in these red clay colors with the, you know, the red draping and all this stuff. I mean, it's primarily what he's featured in, right? Because we're trying to emphasize the earthiness of Christ and his incarnation. And but blue is is blue is vivacious and feminine and intense and and emotional and I I th- I see that chapel first of all just just as stunning but also as kind of a turning point in the emotional perception of the color. Mm. That's really cool. I I never would have thought about it the sort of emotional tenor of it. Um but there is the richness there and it's funny I was looking up looking up the the, the that chapel as you were uh, talking there um and I know as as unfortunately often happens with things that you only know from like you know, art history websites or like art books or whatever. Like, I know a ton of images from that chapel, but I'd never seen the whole like ensemble, even as a Isn't photograph. So you know, funny? which is like really, I, I, I mean, it's funny, but I also hate it. Like, I make, I make, I just feel like a fraud. You know, it's like, oh well, yes, I know all about them, jotty. You know, yes, certainly. <laughs> you know, and then it's like, oh crap, that's all in the same freaking chapel, and the whole point is that it's an ensemble. You know, but like anyway, it's great. Um, it's American problems. Um. Uh, but like that's no, but that's super cool. Um, and you know, and but that it doesn't surprise me that you would see or that one would see a certain kind of emotional uh, uh rising of the emotional register, uh, raising of the emotional register because um, you know, this is all happening. It, it's also it's a raising of the divine register, right? Like in in older sure. images, um, I uh, you know you'd get big lush beautiful gold backgrounds but then like after the 12th century and of course you'll still keep your beautiful lush gold backgrounds but um but other times you'll have these lush beautiful blue backgrounds and they're having a very similar effect um and Giotto, rather than having like the cool lush beautiful gold background here in this chapel um he has these wild stung stunningly beautiful like what color is heaven heaven is blue Mm -hmm. you know like that's that's just that's how it is you know um like heaven is real, heaven is seen by five year old boys, and heaven is blue. Like we just, can we can we make that as a Patreon exclusive piece of content? We just make our own little parody, and it'll be like you, Benjamin, buttoned out as a deep fake little boy, just like I died and I saw heaven, <laughs> and it was blue, Daddy. It was, it blue. was blue. I think it was covered in. <laughs> Dad said, "Son is like, so." Dad's like, "Son, if you tell me he- heaven is covered in woad, I'm gonna beat you so hard." <laughs> heaven is a woad orgy, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> you should make billions of dollars on a fake book about it. <laughs> um, anyway, just a little shade. Just a little shade. Just a little. Um, just a little. No big deal. I wouldn't worry about it. Well, okay, so I want to know. I, I'm about to make the same mistake again because yes. I want to now jump to the impressionists and do like it. no, do these guys. I, I, so I intentionally, I intentionally uh, did not do any looking at the modern period. A because of disposition, um, and B because you're an asshole. <laughs> Uh, no, B, because I just knew that you would know more about it. Um, and so I thought I would, you know, I would like, uh, I want, I See, want, but your that's the difference between you and me because I, I go, Father Gabriel's going to know more about the ancient stuff than me. So I'm going to study the ancient stuff more so I can keep up with him. And you go, he's going to know more about the more modern stuff than me. So he's got it. it. Yeah, he's got it. He's got it. No, I mean, like, what do, what do I know about the impressionists in blue? Like, Monet's got a lot of paintings with a lot of blue in it. Um, yeah, he does. Picasso is not an impressionist, but he has a blue period. Yeah, I that's true. Things I have thoughts. So, See, so I, thoughts I, I guess I'm being I'm being reductionistic and a little narrow when I talk about just the impressionist period. I'm not just talking about the impressionist period. Um, I'm talking about kind of the semi modern period. So even into the Baroque, um, uh, there is there are several really incredible stories uh, coming out of the Renaissance and then into the Baroque period and then ultimately with the with the um, with the impressionist where uh one of them and and there's argument about whether these are true or not but but just to emphasize how expensive and sought after blue is i guess these are a couple of fun facts on that so uh michelangelo uh doesn't end up finishing his his painting the entombment and the most popular argument for this is that he literally could not afford enough blue to finish it 
That's um, amazing. That is one thing. Uh, cutting forward several hundred years, Vermeer, the Baroque artist Vermeer, oh, uh, that's the best. He puts his entire family into debt painting a girl with a pearl earring because of how obsessed with using blue he is. Um, so I this mean, is you the look kind at his of paintings thing we're talking and like, about. Yeah, I mean, sure they did. Sure they didn't eat for a while, but like his paintings, you know, just saying. <laughs> well, and what's cool about this is that people need people still want to use blue. But lapis lazuli is so, so expensive. And so alternatives start getting created. And that's this really important thing in art, art history, cobalt. Um, oh, sure. That that comes around where... Those are the little goblins that live underground. Oh, right. those are cobalts. Sorry, cobalts. Yeah, You sorry. are such a nerd. God, you are so, you are so glad, lucky to be celibate because, my God. <laughs> Thank you. That kind of joke would not take you very um, So, ultra, uh, what we're talking here with Lapis Lazuli, the actual paint here, I guess we haven't mentioned this, the actual paint that that comes out of this this true blue is is what's ultramarine, right? Coming from the Latin, beyond the sea. So, super intense. Ultramarine, this is the sought after paint that we're talking about here. But cobalt becomes the store brand, you know, the, the, the off brand kind of bullshitty version you can buy. Big K blue. Yeah. Right, exactly. Big K blue. And it's it's um it's made by literally just crushing up cobalt glass. And it oh. looks really good when you first apply it. But in like 10 minutes, that's an exaggeration. But over the course of a couple, you know, years, a couple decades, fades to like a yellow gray. Oh no. And, um what's cool about this is it gets us into how color is perceived retroactively um because a lot of the paintings you'll see in museums even now have these very gray skies and that's right, associated sure. we now look at that and we go oh yes very somber refined painting blah blah, blah. no not at all. These were It's actually because like the world was just always overcast until right. the 20th century. Right, exactly. No, but isn't that crazy? Like we think like this is partially why medieval paintings are oh, we always see them as a, oh everything's gray, everything's somber. No, it wasn't. It's just the paint faded, man. The, yeah, another great example bro. of this. Another great example of this is like um, you know, ancient Greek Greco-Roman art was extremely gaudy and covered in color, just enameled right. everywhere in color. Right. All the color fades by the time the Italian Renaissance picks up, they're seeing all these now white statues and they're they're saying, oh, we want to reinvent Greco-Roman life. We should have white statues completely missing out and on, on the fact uh, on what these ones looked like and then when we go back and we do greco-roman stuff we're referencing the renaissance's depiction of greco-roman stuff and so we're also depicting it white and i just think that's super super fascinating how we we perceive a culture through how its color fades essentially yeah yeah and, yeah yeah this is a huge and, thing yeah. and we do view you know all these kind of old timey people, whether we're talking about the Baroque or we're talking about, you know, the realists or any of these guys, we do view them as these very somber people in part because of their gray, rainy skies, but they weren't originally gray and rainy. It's just that the artists were too poor to afford lapis lazuli. <laughs> it's like, well, the thing about cobalt is, you know, this big K blue was so great at the art exposition in like 1880, but now it's kind of garbage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It doesn't work so so well now. Thankfully, 1826, a French chemist creates French ultramarine, which is a synthetic response to lapis lazuli, oh, and it holds up, and that oh, changes okay. everything. And that's what gets us into the impressionist movement: is that now guys like Monet with, uh, you know, with the water lilies and Van Gogh with Starry Starry Night and everything are are able to produce these blue pigments without destroying their families the way the way vermeer does only you know a little while earlier um, oh you know that, that boy a revolution yeah and that puts a really different tent like sort of material cultural feel to like you know the for me like one of the most powerful things about like physically looking at uh van gogh is just like seeing the like thick gobbed up layers of paint you know like you mentioned starry starry night i mean it's just like that thing is uh i mean it looks like a, 
when you're looking at it in person, it looks like a geological map, you know? I mean, it's like, it's got these, it's like thick, yeah, huge it's, it's ranges. Yeah. It's topographical. Exactly. Like it's got these thick ranges of like, uh, highs and like, uh, d- crests and valleys and stuff because he's just slathering stuff everywhere you know um and it had never occurred to me actually to think about how um how much that would have been impossible at any other period in history you know i think that's yeah it's a cool thing like we don't we don't think about how you know we say things like think outside the box but we don't think about how I think that that sets up an unnecessarily antagonistic relationship towards the box. Um, yes. Like we don't. But what about thinking inside the box? Actually? Right. We don't think about how the box actually creates art periods. Right. That that when you're looking at Giotto and the stuff that he's doing and the flatness of that art and stuff like that, that's being some of those decisions are being made because of the confines of color real estate, and yeah. and right. we're establishing h- color hierarchies. Because we can only use a little bit of blue. So we're going to use it for the yeah. most important stuff. And then that's establishing an unconscious visual hierarchy. And and these are people taking the restrictions, the confines of what they have access to and using that not as a, a disability or a limit, but as a creative prompt to to think outside that box and say, what can we do with this? And then when there's a change, you know, in the technology and what's available. You're not going to see people doing that same style of art anymore. You're going to see people like Van Gogh saying, wow, I now have access to paint and I'm starving and I can still paint. And what can I do with that just amount of of sheer material? I can do these type of uh, typographical topographical paintings. Um, and then you see the same thing now with the digital revolution and, and vector art and things like this. Yeah. That, that styles change because of what we have access to. And I think so often as artists, we can get really limited by, Oh, I don't have access to that thing. I wish I had this. I mean, now the version of that is, I wish I had this software. I wish I could afford. I, as John Mulaney says, I, why Karen? Cause I can't afford Adobe Photoshop. And, and like this, <laughs> exactly. the, you know, we, we get very limited by it, but I, I think what we see in the history of color usage and things like this is the greatest artists are the ones who accept those limitations and say, what cool shit can I make using this limitation as a prompt? Um, yeah, exactly. And you definitely right. see I that with the synthetic exactly right. blue, the, the French ultramarine that's being Ooh, created French in the 1820s. Marine. Yeah. 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 No, I love that. Like this is a, uh, I, um, I once made my, my high school junior year humanities class teacher upset because we had to produce these like end of the year projects that were like dramatic and they were like on stage at night. It was this evening thing, friends and family invited and like surprisingly people really came. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, it was just like big thing you'd present. It'd be kind of like half dramatic or you make a, you know, it wouldn't just be like you with a PowerPoint or whatever. It'd be this like big sort of, um, show that you were trying to do. And like, uh, my case was that like, um, uh, cause you know, she was a sort of a fun, like lovely woman. She was always talking about like, gotta be an individual, you know, gotta be free spirit and kind of like, you know your voice in this you know and i was so my, my my final project was um arguing that um that conformity is the basis of good art see but um, i kind of love that honestly and then but of course this was the ground for it like i mean in the, in the end i was just fra- phrasing it polemically because i wanted to push back on on uh what i felt like was right, you polemically both, access on you, you and i both really share a joy of pissing people off unnecessarily yeah, exactly. uh, with the language yeah. that we use to describe things that actually most people would agree with but we, yeah, we can it's like say actually it, hard to argue with yeah in we fact, can say yeah. in a volatile uh antagonistic way we will yeah why not um but that's it. that's obviously it it's just that like actually you have to have some limitations to push against in order to be able to um actually have boundaries in which to like give your mind space to think you have to have a box to think outside of you know let's let's make that that's let's make the antagonism towards the box a little less yeah um i'm so glad you mentioned the stage thing though because i almost totally forgot and because going into this episode i was like oh shit all my examples are are like paint and sculpture and you know uh you know, the, the handcrafted arts and I'm not doing anything with cinema. I'm not doing anything with dance. I'm not doing anything with theater. So my wife who for a very, very long time was a professional dancer trained in New York. Um, I sat down with her and I was like, what are some of your favorite examples of the color blue? And she brought up this really amazing one that I wasn't familiar with, but that I do want to share. Um, are you familiar with the ballet serenade? 
No, I don't think so. Okay. Cernade is uh, 1935, I think she said, um, by George Balanchine. You know, okay, sure. iconic, iconic choreographer um, with a, with a, to a composition by Tchaikovsky. And it's a 33 minute ballet that is about the process of ballet. Okay, sure. um, it is a deconstructionist ballet about the process of ballet. And the way that Balanchine did this was that um, as they were rehearsing it, he would adapt the mistakes that they made into the final performance. So at one point during the rehearsals, like a girl falls. And now in the choreography, even to this day, the actress dancing that part still falls at that exact same point. That's um, amazing. Yeah, really yeah, yeah. cool. It was sort of this living document that they kept adding to and adjusting and people would just pay homage to it before he chose to do that. There was a couple different versions of it. Earlier versions use white and things like this, but the final version and the version that's performed all over the world, even now, everything is blue. The background oh, is blue. The lighting is blue. The leotards are all blue. Um, and I don't know why I, I would love to be able to say, I know why I, I try to research a bunch into why she tried to my wife, uh, research a bunch into why, um, but as best I can figure, it's this thing that I'm kind of, or at least as best I can, as I can infer, it's the same thing that I'm observing with the arena chapel, right? Which is that blue is this extremely passionate, provocative, emotional color. And, and Balanchine is trying to kind of strip the facade off of ballet at this point. And he's trying to show it as this living document, as opposed to a final polished product. And of course that's gotta be blue and how interesting that he's starting out off with white which is this color of perfection and completeness and purity and all these things uh you know see our episode on lilies and and but he's but in order to better represent the melancholic artistic experience and the fluidness and the brokenness and how how falling during rehearsal is actually part of it and all these things that we settle on on this intensely vibrantly uh uh ultramarine color palette um, I thought awesome. that was a really, really cool example. Um, obviously, yeah. you know, music, things like I'm blue, da ba dee, da ba die, or, had to happen uh, sometime. or, you know, uh, what's it called? Um, blue lips by, um, Regina Spector, which is like truly oh, yeah, she's a fantastic fun. song. She's fun. She's great. Um, I love her. Uh, or Rhapsody in Blue, of course. Um, oh yeah. Rhapsody in Blue. I totally forgot about Rhapsody in Blue. That's great. Yeah. 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 Um, did you yeah. ever see, um, did you ever see Fantasia 2000? I did. I did. I Fantasia did. Fantasia 2000's is, Rhapsody in Blue is one of the single greatest pieces of animation ever made. I, it's really I great. I love it it's really so great. much. It's just, for those who haven't seen it, they, they, because Fantasia is the original truly insane acid trip that Walt Disney did experimentally with Salvador Dali um, and, and like a couple major composers back, you know, in the olden days. And then in 2000, they wanted to revisit the concept and do a sort of spiritual sequel. Um, and they produced two of my favorite pieces of animation ever. One is the Rhapsody in Blue that you're talking about, Father Gabriel, where uh, they are depicting a day in the life of different New Yorkers um, and the mechanics of the construction sites and the and the subway and all these things become the percussion and these huge swirling instrument uh, instrumentals. Um, but then the other one is so, so great. Uh, it's uh, it's. Donald Duck in Noah's Ark to oh the my gosh, um, I don't to, remember this at all to the tune of or to the symphony of pomp and circumstance oh it my is gosh. so great it is so funny because Noah just gets pissed off and like abandons the ark and then God chooses Donald Duck to have to do it instead and then they do this like sleepless in Seattle thing but it 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 uh, generated one of my favorite memes of all time and I know we're getting so off track here but it 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 did it uh, generated one of my favorite memes of all time where um this like Disney blog I follow put together. They just found all the quotes, all the most kind of horrifying quotes from the Noah story in Genesis. And then just put them on photos of Donald duck. Oh my gosh. That's <laughs> so like, great. And it's like, and God said to man, I will destroy you. Or God said unto Donald duck, I will destroy all mankind for I can find nothing but wickedness among them. Or like, and God said to Donald duck, you will slaughter one of every creature and sacrifice unto me. <laughs> it's just truly, awesome. truly wonderful, wonderful bits that I'm so such, such a fan of. Anyway, that's Rhapsody in blue. Um, um, one more really cool, oh, a couple other thoughts, um, that I want to share. Did you know 
so we talked about how only a few years ago the the um the fact that uh egyptian lapis lazuli blue can be seen under fluorescent light was discovered did you know that we're still discovering new blues oh sure that makes sense yeah i mean i didn't know that but sure so in 2009 um, this was actually huge in the art world. In 2009, a new shade of blue was accidentally discovered. This uh, I'm reading this from the Met. Um, it was actually discovered by Professor Mass Subramanian, which is like the coolest name I've ever heard of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and is then graduate student Andrew E. Smith, not as cool a name, at Oregon State University. While exploring new materials for making electronics, Smith discovered that one of his samples turned bright blue when heated. Named Yinmen Blue after its chemical makeup of yttrium, indium, and manganese, uh, they released the pigment for commercial use in 2016, and it is now a Crayola crayon. Wow, Yinmen Blue, baby! I, I love that. Right? I love that. That's awesome. We're not yeah, yeah, just yeah. talking about blue as this ancient. It's not just William the Hippo, right? The story of William the Hippo is the story of Yinmen Blue. Now that we're just our relationship with color is still actively evolving our emotional relationship with color. Um, and, and the actual technical relationship with color is actively evolving. I I'm kind of in love with that. Yeah. That we can't, we can't ever part. I mean, part of the point of doing it's kind of like cultural, historical, art, historical run through looking at this one color. Um, I hope one thing that it helps us to see is that, um, color is not just like a static given reality you know that we can measure things in terms of wavelengths um which again may not be the the most like experientially accurate way of doing it but we can you know we can do these kinds of things you know say up to the, this wavelength it's blue and after this wavelength it's red and after this one it's green or whatever but like um i but that it exists like these these physical realities even something that seems as basic to our experience as like a color the color blue um actually embeds us in this whole relationship like this whole like complex network of relationships with um our families uh the people who pursue the truth and uh the goods of being a human being in the same way that we do you know the culture that we live in um the time period that we live in like the material and technological abilities uh and possibilities and availabilities of the culture in which we live in um and that that's like that's not some weird thing that's just what it means to be a human being and so it should it, we should expect it to play out with respect to literally everything and that includes something that seems as like basic static and and like um determined and given to us already as like what are the colors that exist and how do we use them it's it's this hot take that i keep posing over and over and over again in this podcast and that i'm actively unpacking and exploring and and you know further establishing for myself uh, of the idea uh, of art as relationship, right? That, that when, and we talked about this a lot in the, um, in the episode and sort of home shitty home goods paintings, um, th- th- this idea that when I experience a piece of art, I am experiencing relationship with the artist who made it. And there is an unspoken connection between the two of us, but it's something we've also talking about on a, or we also talked about on a larger scale where when I create a piece of art, I am operating the tradition of that creation process along with every other other artist before me. So whether that's me, you know, when I do, when I, when I perform in the most recent production of serenade, the ballet, I am performing along with, and am somehow in connection relationship with everybody who has been in that production since Balanchine created it. Right. And I think the most kind of broad spectrum of this, well, maybe not the most broad spectrum. The most broad spectrum is just participating in the kingdom of God and and kind of the body of Christ and the community of of, of Christianity. But the at least one of the broadest uh, applications of this creatively is like when you when you pour out that tube of blue paint that you got from the arts uh, discount store. You are actually participating somehow in this sort of pseudo artistic communion of saints along with Van Gogh as he creates Starry Night and along with Giotto as he creates the Arena Chapel and along with the mofo what carved William the Hippo. And that is so cool to me. The, The community of blue that you 
participate in when you paint with blue, the community of red, the community of painters, the community of dancers. I think it just enriches the artistic experience when you know that this little piddly thing that you feel like you're doing that doesn't really matter so much is actually just the latest float in a uh, trans chronological parade of other others who have come before you and others who will come after you who are still, as we're talking about with Yinmen, discovering new blues, discovering new ways to apply this and, and finding new boxes to think outside of a hundred, 500, 10 hundred years from now. I think that's really, really edifying. It is to me anyway, as an artist. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and you know, one thing just, I, I, um, I would be remiss. I think, uh, normally I'm not going to like, this is, this is a podcast this is where we think about, we find a piece of our own evidence and we reflect on them together and we share them. But this, I think I would be remiss if I didn't, um, uh, share with you and with our listeners, um, the sort of major source that I was drawing from, from, from the kind of historical stuff that I was talking about. Um, because it's a, you think about being in, in relationship, being in continuity, um, I uh, there's some there's a rich context here of thought and reflection on it as well that I think would be really fruitful if you if you found this stuff interesting and you kind of want to dig into it more deeply um, as like a one stop shop. Um, I could not recommend more highly this book by a, it sees a French guy named Michel Pastoureau. It's been translated into English uh, and it's called just blue colon the history of a color. Ooh. It's a be- it's a beautiful book. It's beautifully printed. Um, it's a uh, it's a it's a scholarly book, uh, and so some aspects of it are technical. But um, he's it's really pre- presented and proposed in a way to. Um, it's not a coffee table book, but it's presented in a way to invite people into a relationship, to like invite people to let this be a tool that they use to think about their world. Um, and since I've just benefited so much from it, um, that I, I just want to make sure that I hand that on because I think it's something that, um, if this is something that you're into, um, there's a lot more in there that I think, um, could really like spark further reflection, further ideas, and like your own further engagement with like how, what does this mean for you and for your own artistic process and for your own um, life as an artist and as a viewer? Yeah. And, and if I can offer, I mean, that's a brilliant suggestion. And I, I think offering a resource ideas is always a good choice. But uh, if I can offer a piggyback resource, that's actually really good. There's um, a really beautiful, I don't know if you'd call it like a lyrical poem or, or a musical ballad, um, but it's it's uh, very ancient. It's by Eiffel 65. It's called Blue oh, Daba D. Yes, thank you. Um, yes. And I think Blue Daba D by the balladeers Eiffel 65 is just uh, a really excellent treatise on the color blue that people should probably also check out. So, <laughs> 100%. I couldn't agree more. Well, on that note, with resources aplenty and facts too many, uh, we thank you guys for checking out um, our podcast, this little episode, our weird exploration of the color blue. Uh, Do check out our Patreon at catholiccreatives.org forward slash support and uh, catholic.store to see how you can support artists and uh, go and create blue things. You've been listening to Creative Things, a podcast of Catholic creatives, hosted by Father Gabriel Toretta O.P. and Jacob Flores Popcheck, produced by Jessica Flores Popcheck and Kyle Meineke. To find out more about how you can support the podcast and other ventures for artists, visit catholiccreatives.org forward slash support.